Multiplying two numbers together might seem like a pretty innocuous piece of mathematics. We all learn how to do this in high school, for instance. But if your two numbers are enormous, for example in cryptography you're trying to find the largest prime numbers, then the efficiency of the algorithm to multiply enormous numbers starts to really matter. And in this video I want to take you on a little bit of a journey of the development of increasingly sophisticated multiplication algorithms. Let's quickly review that grade school algorithm. If I have two numbers, like 32 multiplied by 56, then the basic mechanism goes something like this. I'm going to take the two things in the ones column, multiply them to get 12. Some of you like to write the one up at the top, or I'm going to leave it down at the bottom. And then you might multiply 3 times 6 and get 18, but it shifted over by 1. You could put a 0 after the 18 if you like. Then you multiply the 5 and the 2, you get a 10, also shifted over by 1, and finally you're multiplying the 3 and the 5, that gives you a 15, shifted over twice. It's 1500. Add those four numbers up, and you get 1792 final answer. And depending on exactly how you were taught and where in the world, you might organize your information a little bit differently, but this is the basic algorithm that most of us are familiar with. And what I really want to note is that in this algorithm, you have to do four different sub-multiplications, four different multiplications of single digits, like 2 times 6 is 12. After you get those four results, then you have to add them up. So there's four multiplications and three additions to do this algorithm. And in general, if you're multiplying two n-digit numbers together, it takes n squared total multiplications to get your answer. A different take on this is if I look at a number like 32, I can think of this as 3 times 10 plus 2. In general, if a number has digits like a, b, then what I really mean by this is a times 10 plus b, and live similarly, c times 10 plus d. So if I multiply these two things out, then what I can get is ac times 10 squared, ad plus bc times 10, and finally bd just times 1. That is, there are four different multiplications as we've seen before. This is the same algorithm you know and love, I've just perhaps organized it differently on the screen. But now I'm going to do a trick. Let me look at that middle term, that tens term, the AD plus BC times 10 term. I'm going to replace these two multiplications by one multiplication. It's just a little bit of algebra, there's almost nothing to it. If I expand out A plus B times C plus D, I get terms like AC and BD, and so I just subtract them off and these two things are equal. But now I notice that AB plus CD, well there's one multiplication there, and then there's two more AC and BD, but AC and BD are multiplications I have to do anyways. I have to do AC, I have to do BD. And so now I have a total of only three single digit multiplications that I need to do in this algorithm. This is called the Karatsuba algorithm. Now, while I have a gain that I have less multiplications to do, I do have more additions to do. But as we're going to see a little bit later, and depending on your computer's architecture, multiplications are going to be the things that slow us down. So having to do less multiplications, even at the cost of more additions, is going to be a net benefit to us. Okay, so let's run that caret suba algorithm out for our 32 times 56. I still have to do the ones, and I still have to do the 100s. The 12 and the 15 are exactly the same, but it's the thing in the middle that's going to change. Via the algorithm, I'm going to expand this out, and then if I plug in the numbers, the result that I get is just going to be 28. But indeed, 12 plus 280 plus 1500 is the same thing as 1792, the same result we got before. Now, I actually think that this is slower for us humans doing small numbers like this. Partly this is because single digit multiplication is something we've all memorized. We've all memorized this times table, so you can say 7 times 8 and you immediately know the answer. So getting less single digit multiplications, which for humans we've memorized, in the cost of having to do more additions is actually slower for us humans for these small numbers. The Karasuba algorithm isn't going to replace your mental math quickly. But where it's going to shine is when I consider larger numbers. Let's just go a little bit larger up. Let's do an 8 digit times an 8 digit. Because I can do Karasuba over and over and over again. Uh, first I'll try color coding in the same way where I break a number up as an A and a B and a C and a D. Really what I'm saying is this is 1, 2, 3, 4 times 10,000 plus 5, 6, 7, 8. If I imagine thinking of the A, B, C, D as sort of blocks that keep together, I'm going to get four different 
sub-multiplications that I'd have to compute out. But Karatsuba says that instead of four sub-multiplications, I only need three. Indeed, these two sort of diagonal ones can be condensed into just a single multiplication. And then same, let me take any one of these multiplications I have to do, that's now four by four. Well, I can do the same thing. I can write this as a times 100 plus b, so 1200 plus 34, and 9100 plus one. I try to think about what would be the four different sub-multiplications I need to do, and two of them by the Karatsuba algorithm I can remove down to one multiplication. And then two by two, we've already seen how I can take two by two and just to three one by one multiplications. And so I can take this divide and conquer approach and just do it over and over and over again. Let's imagine I'm taking two numbers of size two to the power of k and multiplying them. If it's not exactly two to the k, you can just imagine having a few more zeros at the front until it's the closest power of two. But with two to the k's, this is gonna be mostly efficient because now I can imagine having and having and having, just as we did before, eight, four, two, one. I can do that when it's powers of two. And for every stage where I take a number up and I break it in half, then I can say that there's three multiplications at that stage. So in general, there's gonna be three to the k multiplications needed to multiply out to two to the k numbers. I can do just a little bit of uh, fun log stuff, like three to the k, well, that's the number of multiplications. If n is two to the k, then k is logarithm base two of n, so I can just write this as three to the logarithm base two of n. I can use some log rules to interchange the three and the n, and if I compute out what log base two of three is, it's nine to about 1.58. And this is an improvement, because the algorithm that you and I all know that we were taught in school took n squared multiplications, and now we only need about n to the 1.58 as n becomes arbitrarily large. We've got a faster algorithm. Now, to be fair, this all depends on what your computer is actually doing. That is, they've either got hardware circuitry in the actual chip or very low level microcode that has the ability to multiply numbers together if they're going to be of a certain size. So for example, you might have a 32-bit by 32-bit hardware multiplier, which is able to quickly use its hardware to multiply any numbers as long as you can express them in 32 bits. So if that was the case, then what you might do with the Karatsuba algorithm is not use powers of 10, like I illustrated when I was doing this just for us humans that are familiar with powers of 10, you might do a breakup in powers of two to the 31, leaving maybe one extra digit for dealing with carrying. So that is, you might take any number and you might express it as a times some power of two to the 31 plus b, and here the a and the b can both be expressed within the 32 digits. And so this means that for enormous numbers, numbers way bigger than just 32 bits, you can recursively apply the Karatsuba algorithm until you get down to multiplying two numbers that can be written within 32 bits. And you do that now with the hardware multiplication in your computer. Okay, so what I've told you so far was really just the beginning of a story. I told you about the Karatsuba algorithm. It came about in 1960. And as we talked about, its complexity is n to the 1.58 multiplications for large values of n. Very quickly after Karatsuba, there was a generalization to Cook, and this has been implemented in a lot of different computers. Now, for small numbers, just the normal n squared algorithm is actually faster because you've got this extra overhead with memory and with additions, but for numbers after about 10 to the 96, the Toom Cook or Karatsuba algorithms tend to dominate the n squared algorithms. And for a bunch of different applications, as I mentioned before, cryptography, they're carried out with some version of one of these types of algorithms. That isn't the end of the story because after Karatsuba and Toom Cook, Sean Haggis Strassen came out with a fundamentally different algorithm in 1971. Oh, by the way, this Strassen is the same Strassen that did these algorithms for large matrix multiplication. I've done a video on that, you can check it out. Sean Haggis Strassen aren't just using this little bit of algebraic trickery I showed in this video, they're using the machinery of discrete fast Fourier transforms. And that's something I might like to unpack in a different video. But for this video, these fast Fourier transforms allowed for this new algorithm that is substantially faster than what we'd seen before. 
and it has applications. For example, I, I've talked previously in the channel about the great Mersenne prime search, finding these enormous prime numbers. Well, it turns out that after somewhere between tens and hundreds of thousands of digits, the Sean Hagestrassen algorithm starts to beat out the Toom Cook algorithms that we had before that, that were used for these sort of lower level things like cryptography. And indeed, this algorithm is basically sort of the go-to algorithm that's actually implemented for computing these really large numbers. But this still isn't the end of the story because this order of n times log n times log log n was always a little bit weird to Sean Haga and Strassen. Because they use fast Fourier transforms and because fast Fourier transforms have an inherent n log n complexity to them, it wasn't likely that you could get faster than n logarithm of n. But they did conjecture that you could get rid of the log log n part and that the best of these algorithms in this sort of class using these Fourier transforms could thus just be n log n. And while there has been some improvements chipping away over the years, that best conjectured result didn't come until 2019 with Harvey and Hoven. They managed to come up with a new algorithm still using uh, fast Fourier transforms, but using them more aggressively, using more of them and managed to get to that conjectured result n log n complexity. And so this is sort of presumed to be the best possible result here, unless possibly someone comes up with a completely different type of approach because of the intrinsic complexity within Fourier transforms. And this result is theoretically fascinating, but it's what we sometimes call a galactic algorithm. This we don't implement in code. Nobody's using Harvey Hoven today to try to compute out these enormous numbers. And the main reason for this is just you need enormous numbers for this new algorithm to actually be better than the Sean Hagen Strassen algorithm. They've got one possible number, so it's known to be better after two to the 1729, to the power of 12, this outrageously enormous number. Maybe that can come down a little bit in time, but still, we're talking about vast, vast, vast numbers beyond the level of applications that we're using today. And it's actually kind of interesting, as I mentioned, a lot of this depends on your computer architecture design, which is sort of beyond what I'm trying to talk about in this video. But it is worth noting that the gap between uh, hardware multiplications and additions in computer architecture has come down a lot. And actually in some cases it's even flipped the other way around and multiplications can even be faster. And so despite its theoretical intrigue, the practical applications of this new algorithm is indeed somewhat limited. If you are interested in deeply learning about all sorts of cool algorithms like these ones, then I strongly recommend today's sponsor, Brilliant.org. Brilliant is an online learning platform and they have thousands of lessons across mathematics, computer science, and more that all are delightfully interactive. You might specifically like this course on algorithms and data structures. It dives more into, for instance, the big O notation that I was using pretty casually in this video. One of the things I really appreciate about Brilliant is how they are constantly getting you to self-assess your own understanding and when you get something wrong, they are there to help you figure out what the right answer is. As a math professor, I know that this kind of active, student-centered learning is highly effective and that's why I am so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. To try everything that Brilliant has for free for a full 30 days, go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazin or click the link down in the description. And the first 200 of you to click that link are going to get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, thank you for watching this video. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and we'll do some more math in the next video.